Well, welcome back to the hot seat. I'm delighted today uh, to be joined by David Stewart, who's managing director of Coriats from Turks and Caicos. Uh, welcome, David. Thank you. And it really is a hot seat today because we're in London. <laughs> Uh, and it is nearly 30 degrees uh, uh, outside, which is astonishing. It's hotter than the Turks and Caicos. And you've just got off a flight uh, from uh, Turks and Caicos, so grateful to you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Um, but before we get into our discussion, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about your background. And we're just going to sort of position Turks and Caicos, or TCI, mm -hmm. uh, for the audience today. So first of all, it'd be really interesting to hear a little bit more about your background and what took you uh, from the UK uh, out mm -hmm. overseas offshore. So I, I grew up as a, a lawyer in London and uh, went out to the Turks and Caicos very briefly in the early 90s and then came back to London in 92. I then had a career as a litigation lawyer in London for about 25 years and then I took a step sideways into law firm management and I ended up being managing partner and CEO of a law firm called Oldswang till about 2015. Uh, I'd always wanted to go back to the Caribbean and try mm. and build a career uh, in the Turks and Caicos where I had a home. And uh, in 2015, I decided to take the plunge and do it. And we uh, bought, uh, my business partner, Conrad Griffiths, and I bought Coriats in 2016. Uh, and that has been the start of a really interesting chapter of my career. It's been a real, really a lot of fun. Fantastic. I mean, for those less familiar with the geography, I mean, perhaps tell us where it is in the Caribbean. How does it connect mm. to other destinations people will be familiar with? Uh, give us the sense of the geography. So the Turks and Caicos is best known for its you know, sort of high-end, five-star, celebtastic, holiday-making sort of uh, mm. side. It's uh, 33 islands, not many people know, it's 33 mm. different islands, eight of which are inhabited. There are two main islands. The, the biggest by far, Providenciales, is the island that I live on and work on. It's a British overseas territory. It's about an hour from Miami. It has a US dollar economy. Um, and it's a very successful uh, and fast-growing economy, or at least it was until COVID. Mm. And we've now bounced back uh, very strongly indeed. So we have a, uh, a, a stable government, British Overseas Territory, British Governor, uh, legislatively very similar to BVI and Cayman, mm. but not known for its offshore industry as much as it is for its tourism industry. Mm. And that's something I hope to change mm. over the next uh, five years. But great connectivity there, one hour to Miami, and from there... Uh, well, global, the, tu but, the tourism yeah. industry has given us a lot of gifts, and one mm. of them is great airlifts. So we have over 100 international flights a week, um, and mm. there are four flights a day to New York, eight flights a day to Florida, and flights to almost every other city on the East Coast, and Toronto and Montreal daily. So it's mm. a very connected place. What about the, the local professional infrastructure? I mean, I'm aware of a couple of firms there like Bordier mm. and others, but perhaps you mm. could sketch out what the local professional services industry is like. So the local professional services industry is, uh, as you'd expect, for a smaller jurisdiction. We've got Grant Thornton, mm. we've got BDO, uh, we've got Bordier Bank, there's another Swiss bank called Turks and Caicos Banking Corporation, and then we've got the Canadian banks, RBC, FCIB and Scotia. Uh, there are no international law firms. Uh, there's one Bahamian law mm. firm, Graham Thompson & Co. Uh, uh, but there are uh, three large law firms in the Turks and Caicos that have been there for many years. And, and one of those is a law firm in which I'm also a partner, Griffiths & Partners. So I imagine that collaboration with firms in other jurisdictions is a mm. common part of your working practice. You're presumably often yep. working with firms in London, Switzerland, other parts of the Caribbean, the US. Correct. So yeah. I, mean, I, I spend a lot of my time on the road. Mm. Um, almost none of my clients or families in the trust company come from the Turks and Caicos. So Coriats has been in existence for f nearly 45 years. We've got a, an amazing roster of very uh, high profile families mm. uh, who are based uh, in Turkey, Canada, the US, uh, Switzerland and the UK. Um, and uh, our, our role really is uh, a multi-family office style trust company mm. and we look after those families, we, look, we help them with their investment management, we help them with their uh, asset purchases and disposals and all of the things you'd expect um, that wealthy families need. So with all kind of assets, you know, uh, international real estate, trading companies, like you say, investment management, is there? Yeah, I mean the last yeah. year we bought a tech company in France. We uh, quarterback the corporate deal, chose the lawyers, mm. uh, helped do the due diligence. We've um, bought and sold numerous super yachts, uh, properties all over the world, refinanced um, 
four large condos in Manhattan last week. I mean, it, it's, mm. a, it's a very varied diet of transactions. And what I found you know, really enjoyable is that my network of, you know, from 30 years of practicing law all over the world has been really useful in mm. that I can pick up the phone and talk to people who can help me get things done for the families we look after. Is there anything particularly in the toolkit that you think is, is interesting and relevant for, for advisors in other jurisdictions that they might look to the jurisdiction for? Or is it just generally that all the tools are available that you'd find in other locations? And There's one thing I think we can genuinely claim to do that uh, uh, not many trust companies do, which is that my background is um, 25 years as a senior commercial litigation partner. I did mm. international arbitrations, uh, investment treaty arbitrations, uh, commercial litigation uh, all over the world. So I'm very familiar with litigation, offshore litigation, mm. uh, um, and what I particularly enjoy doing and what I spend most of my professional time doing is acting as a trustee in contentious situations where there are uh, uh, difficult, uh, uh, there's a difficult environment. Mm. The trust, it might be that a trust company, the incumbent trust company is uncomfortable with the litigious environment. So we can come in as co-trustees, we can come in as protectors, but we can help design and implement a litigation strategy, help control costs, make sure mm. that there aren't conflicts in different jurisdictions between advisors and that there's an overall plan of attack. And we're very used to doing that. And where it's necessary or desirable to re-domicile mm. uh, the trust and actually have contentious proceedings in the Turks and Caicos, then we have a strong litigation practice with two QCs who can back me up. So it's a, it's a uh, that is something I think that mm. we, we we think is unusual, and we are finding it is becoming more and more interesting to trustees from other jurisdictions. And also, I guess for new structures, it's looking mm. that you know where with your disputes background, yeah. you know where risks arise. So actually, right. by mm -hmm proactively using that knowledge you can make sure things are set up properly from the start. Yeah, I mean, I've spent all my life looking after families who not, not always perhaps got on as well as they might. Mm. So my, um, my, my passion and drive to create real governance and real family culture, investing cultures, making sure that even if people don't get on, they don't fight over family companies or businesses that we have robust governance structures. All of that experience has been called upon again and again in my, my sort of not so new role mm. as a trustee. But I don't have to do disclosure, witness mm. statements or pleadings, which is great. I, I, I leave that to the lawyers. Yeah. And what's the latest on sort of the transparency agenda in the jurisdiction in terms of registers, publishing of information? Mm -hmm. How do you see Turks and Caicos fitting into that environment where there's information exchanged cross-border? very frequently. So we were an early adopter of CRS. Mm. Uh, we've had our challenges with CRS, mainly technology. Um, mm. We failed uh, to uh, implement CRS as quickly as we'd hoped, but we now have. Um, we are committed to uh, a public register of beneficial ownership by the end of 2023. Right now we're grey listed by the European Union, which is pretty much what every, every other offshore jurisdiction uh, finds itself being, and we are as compliant as Cayman and BVI, mm. um, a, 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 and we expect to be transparent and compliant I, I, I ahead of or equal to our, our sort of sister jurisdictions. Mm. The challenge we've got is that we're very small, so mm. the, the the impact on our uh, on our government legal service, the impact on our regulator, having to create and implement the technology necessary to deliver. Uh, the treaty obligations that we have has been profound mm. and, and difficult. So one of the reasons that government wants to increase the financial services sector in the Turks and Caicos is to help meet the cost and expense of compliance. Mm. Is there a difficulty getting banking locally? I mean, we mentioned some of the name the players that are there, but mm. for cross-border banking, uh, do you find that, that there's partners and solutions? We have relationships in London, Geneva mm. and Zurich where we bank our, our trust clients. You can get local banking. Mm. Um, it's certainly become more difficult but it's not mm. impossible. Um, uh, we have, a, you know, again, a 40 plus year relationship with all of the local banks and bank teams. So no, we've not, we've not found it um, an obstacle. 
uh, uh, to doing business. We can get our clients banked. And is residency also part of the picture? I mean, we talked a bit about the, the offshore structuring side, mm. but is the jurisdiction also trying to attract um, ultra high net worth clients to come and live there, set up and, and do business? Or what, uh, what's the scope uh, on that? Well, I don't want to be cocky, no. but the Turks and Caicos doesn't have to try. They are no. flocking to the jurisdiction. I mean, last year um, we had a real estate market that topped $900 million in 12 months. Wow. Most of that was uh, high net worth immigration, um, people either buying homes because they're renting them out short term because the yields are around 15% mm. gross, or people having a plan B, a second home that they could come mm. to in the event of difficulties or another pandemic. So mm. it's been an absolute avalanche. Mm. We do offer a very reasonable and you know get it whilst it's cheap because it's going to go up in price. Uh, uh, PRC, Permanent Residency Certificate, which um, is, is, uh, is given for a purchase of $1 million mm. in Providenciales and much less than that. So real in the estate other, of $1 million. Real estate, yeah. yeah. And that's very reasonable relative mm. to other islands. And that plus the relevant fee gets you mm. permanent residency for you, a spouse and dependent children for the rest of your life. Mm. Um, so it's not a travel document, but it gives you that base there correct. in the jurisdiction. Uh, if you wanted to mm. move towards naturalization mm. and uh, eventually a passport, um, that would require real residence. And that mm. isn't very attractive uh, mm. to most of the, uh, the, those who are seeking travel documentation. But mm. what, So what we really deal with are people who want somewhere to reside, to perhaps have as their, their taxable residence mm. that's got great airlift and transportation so that, and great mm. uh, connectivity with Wi-Fi high broadband speed so they can work and move around the world but you call TCI their tax residence in their home. Give us a sense of the lifestyle, the culture for people coming there. I mean somewhere like Cayman has a fusion of like UK and and US type culture in the lifestyle. What, what's, what's the TCI's uh, sort of flavour like if you like? I was struck when I first got there by um, uh, how uh, un-English it was and it remains mm. much more influenced by the Bahamas, where there's been mm. a very strong link for many years between the Turks Islanders and the Bahamians, because of course we're very proximate geographically, and the US, the, the, the culture is um, a mix, I think, of Bahamian Caribbean culture and American and Canadian cultures. Um, and it's got much less of a British flavor than Cayman. Mm. Uh, Interesting. Uh, uh, so it's a, it, is, it is, in that respect, quite different. And the business environment, people, if they need it, can get office space, they can hire staff, or what, what's the picture there? Is it more for people who are living, you know, uh, independent, you know, buy a nice property and can work in consulting in, you know, or, or are people mm. moving there and, and setting up base, employing some people locally, perhaps taking office space? or Most of the business immigration, and there's mm. a lot of business immigration, is aligned to the tourism industry. Mm. So it's everything from frozen yoghurt to cinemas to... We're seeing increasingly a small but steady stream of entrepreneurs in fintech mm. and in other technology spaces. And we're seeing, certainly I've seen a lot of people contacting me looking at family office, uh, mm. citing family offices in the Turks and Caicos. So our next focus, I think, is going to be to make sure that we're welcoming those people as a, as a nation that the government mm. is is, is thinking about uh, how to make uh, their arrival easier. Certainly government wants to encourage uh, new business in uh, financial services. We want to see new businesses setting up, new law firms, new fund managers, mm. uh, family offices, uh, uh, trustees, accountants, lawyers. That's the sort of growth that I think uh, we want, the government wants to encourage. Uh, and I certainly support that because a rising tide lifts all boats. Does that extend to crypto and digital assets? I know certain jurisdictions like Cayman BVI have really tried to make a you know a positive home for for businesses in that field. Are you seeing that, or is that still some way to come? I think that that's it's unlikely. The mm. the the leading jurisdictions, I mean, particularly the Bahamas, have made a big play. There's a huge mm. amount of investment. Uh, crypto's uh, taken a stumble. Question is whether it's a long-term fall or just a hiccup. Um, I think for us uh, and for our regulator, whilst we are going to promulgate some regulation around um, uh, crypto and NFTs, the, that's probably uh, the second wave of businesses. 
and I think at the moment we're looking at the more traditional financial mm. services businesses. And in the family office space, I suppose you can offer somewhere where you've got professional staff who can run, you know, run an office, but also mm. nice time for the family to come and spend a few weeks a year or, or a bit more if they want. But how do you see the family office proposition playing out somewhere like uh, Turks and Caicos? It's a lovely place to live and work. Mm. Building a family office is a very stressful and difficult task. It's expensive. Recruitment and retention and, and motivation of staff is a key factor. Uh, it's often wise or necessary to have the, the family office in a low tax or zero tax jurisdiction. The Turks and Caicos ticks a lot of boxes. It's a lovely place to live. There are great mm. schools, mm. restaurants. It's got great infrastructure. It's easy to get on and off. It's relatively low cost. There's a reasonable uh, uh, availability of local uh, labour in terms of admin staff and accountancy and professional support staff. Um, and it has all of the legislation, company insolvency, trust legislation that you'd need to operate structures. Uh, so I think it, it really is a very attractive alternative to the Bahamas or Cayman or BVI. Uh, and we're finding that increasingly so, and, and hopefully that's going to lead to uh, 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 more visibility for the Turks and Caicos as a, uh, a place to do business in financial services. And if you bring in existing members of staff, like you bring the C CFO from off island, that's all relative. That's all easily done yes. and uh, seamlessly. Can, they can so we've got a sophisticated, yeah. and uh, uh, we've had many meetings, lots of discussion. The government is entirely open to granting work permits and, in, in appropriate circumstances, residency permits for people who are going to start financial services businesses. And you'll be hearing a lot more about that from another agency, not from me, um, as the Turks and Caicos starts to promote itself very seriously uh, in the near future as a financial services jurisdiction. But it is absolutely the case that there is a process and that there are, uh, there are a, a easy red carpet welcomes for financial services businesses. And I certainly have had no trouble recruiting um, uh, uh, staff from overseas where I can't find the skill set locally. Terrific. And you're also launching a new initiative, Trust Allies. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit more mm. about that. Well, Trust Allies is uh, an alliance of similar trust companies. At the moment, uh, we have members in uh, South Africa, New Zealand, Dublin, the UK, the Bahamas, and one, our Bahamian uh, colleagues have also uh, just launched uh, in Wyoming uh, uh, in the US, uh, a, 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 a large uh, a trust company, and that's a very uh, valuable asset for, particularly for some Latin American clients. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to offer boutique services. So a lot of um, uh, uh, clients uh, uh, want to have services in more than one jurisdiction either because they've got family members who live in more than, more than mm -hmm. one jurisdiction or because they're, they're so substantial that they need to structure in multiple countries or they need a particular structure in one country but they don't want to uh, be exclusively in that country. They also want the sort of owner-manager boutique style. They want to be dealing with the person who owns the, mm. the business and who's got the experience. Uh, but they, they are struggling to find trust companies that have both the boutique culture, the owner-manager culture, and the international reach. The idea behind Trust Allies is to find similar uh, businesses, those that are owner-managed, that have a culture of being director and owner-led. Um, all, all of the trust companies who belong to Trust Allies uh, have worked together on many occasions before, and the idea is to build a network uh, of, uh, uh, of, of individuals who can serve a client seamlessly, mm -hmm. will have one price point, one relationship director, and in the fullness of time, I hope that that, that will be successful enough that there may be uh, more permanent uh, uh, relationships between the, the different businesses as we grow internationally. So we are um, very proud of what we've achieved so far. And we look forward, I think, to being a real competitor to the big private equity funded mm -hmm. roll-ups as they uh, uh, grow uh, internationally. We, we think we are a viable alternative to them and we'd love to convince families uh, that uh, they should give us a try on any pitch for trust and fiduciary services.